Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the session. We're talking not about Facebook. We're not talking about user engagement. We're talking about people doing real things in real life more. This is about journalists going to schools, which we think we should, instead of just talking amongst ourselves so much as we do. And um, I want to introduce uh, the speaker here, Juliane van Rappert Bismarck. She's uh, She's a German, maritime Englishman living in Belgium. Uh, a work, she has been a working journalist, worked with, the, uh, with Reuters as a correspondent, with the Wall Street Journal, with MLEX, reporting from all kinds of places. Uh, and uh, now she has a different head on, and she will get to that, and I should, for transparency sake, mention I'm a member of her board. So basically, I'm party to this. I'm not the detached, disinterested third person here, but I will try to be as fair as possible. And I'll give the floor to her in a second, and then we will open it up rather soon, and ask, you can ask questions, and then see how far we get along. So, Juliana, here you go. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so, as Willie said, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, what we're doing in this new project. Um, and then we'll maybe have a little discussion. I really hope that we can have a really great discussion about <coughs> what we can do to improve the level of news literacy among specifically young people um, here in Europe, which is actually our, um, um, our remit um, of lie detector. Oh, really? You want me to talk? God, it's so scary. Okay, fine. <laughs> Okay, fine. So um, I have this brand new PowerPoint presentation. I have to tell you, I have so recently left journalism that I'm still not very comfortable with PowerPoint. So, but let's hope it works. Okay. So, let's see. Oh yes, yeah. There we go. So, um, so I, um, I'm a journalist who, about 18 months ago, um, decided, oh my God, after Brexit and Trump, what are we doing, doing beautiful journalism if people can't actually tell the difference? Um, between what's beautiful journalism and what's complete and utter fiction and all the things um, in between. So I founded something called Lie Detectors and you see there um, our funders and a few of the uh, um, organizations that we're partnered with. Um, you see that we're a member of the, the high level group on fake news at the European Commission level, which has got the remit of advising the European Union on what to do sort of in long-term um, long um, uh, solutions for, for disinformation. Um, and what we do is we basically train journalists, we select journalists, we train them and we send them into school room, into classrooms to talk to children aged um, 10 to 15 about fake news and also about media bias. Um, and I'll tell you why we've got this approach um, and why I decided to do this because actually pre first, the first thing was I thought this must exist and I'm going to write about it if it exists. And then it d turned out it didn't exist so I thought, oh damn. I better start it myself. <laughs> um, and what, what, what our, our thinking is quite pessimistic. Our, our thinking is um, along kind of the worst case scenario lines. Um, and we, we think it can't really all, you know, disinformation and the solution to disinformation can't just be left to the tech, tech platforms. Um, and it can't all be left to the debunking initiatives, important though they are. Um, and so our worst case scenario is what if a lot of the disinformation that we've been talking about during this conference a lot, what if a lot of it actually cannot be caught quite as easily by the, by the clever algorithms and by the clever initiatives? Um, and what if the fact-checking sites that do exist and do catch the, the disinformation, if they don't have enough reach, um, or even worse, if those people who do read a fact-checking site don't necessarily believe what they're reading there? Um, and what if this is not only a problem when there's a big WikiLeaks problem or, you know, here the Italian elections, there was, everybody was on the lookout for it, Crosscheck was doing some amazing work ahead of the French elections. What if it's not, the problem is not only this peak that happens during election campaigns, but what if there's actually this very slow drip of drip of disinformation that distorts views and creates world views that then, in a very subtle, low-profile way, change the way people see the world and the way people then interact. Um, and what if this is, and I'm almost ready with this hypothesis, and then I'll go on to what we actually do. What if this is actually reaching people who are much younger than we thought? And I'm talking about children. And what if the parents and the teachers 
are either completely unaware that they are being targeted and they're consuming this stuff, or even if they are aware, they just don't have the words to deal with it. So that sounds really pessimistic, but it's actually quite um, true to some extent. Um, and so in the course of our work, when we work with children, I'm going to tell you an example of something that, that is circulating. So hold on. Oh. Um, there's lots of examples. We come across a lot of examples of what these kids are getting because we're actually asking these questions. Um, and I want to get, show you one example as a really good uh, reminder of why this is actually a really difficult thing to tackle. And then hopefully we'll get into a discussion of how it can be done. Um, so I was talking some time ago, about a year ago, with a very bright teenager from Germany, from a very liberal background, very good, nice city, everything was fine. Um, and I was talking to her, I was checking in with her, because during the, Clinton, the, during the Trump Clinton campaign, her classroom in this very liberal town had been split down the middle between, and these are 13 year olds we're talking about, between supporting Hillary or supporting Trump. And when I had dug into this, it, we had found all the things that the Mueller investigation has now been turning up, which is um, Russian bots circulating complete fabrications via Instagram and all that. Anyway, so I was checking in with her. There was no more, there were no elections going on or anything. I said, how's it going? And it turned out that even though um, her whole class had by now decided that Trump was a bad thing, they were still receiving the kind of messages on Snapchat, on WhatsApp, on Instagram that were kind of continuing that sort of narrative. Um, and I'll show you because she said to me, I've been thinking about the Syrian refugees and I feel very sorry for them but they really do have to take responsibility for their actions and for their very bad reputation. And I said, gosh, that's an interesting uh, comment to make. What makes you say that? So she forwarded me the story that, she, what, that had been circulating. So this is like, I'm not gonna go through the whole story, um, but this is a story that was circulated by Breitbart in January 2017, and that refers to uh, New Year's Eve in a town in Germany called Dortmund, which nobody's really heard of. I mean, you will, but not that many people. It's just a small town, who cares? Um, and it says that a group of um, Syrian refugees took a hold, seized the city during New Year's, during the New Year's Eve celebrations, and set fire to Germany's oldest church, then went on to attack a bunch of homeless people. Um, and then stood around in a huge mob shouting jihadi slogans and unfurling flags of ISIS-related groups. Um, and the thing is, is that none of that was true. There was a slight fire at a church. It was not the oldest church in Germany. There were, there were some injuries sustained by some homeless people by fireworks. And there was a group of Syrian refugees that in fact had... Um, been chanting Allahu Akbar um, around midnight. But the thing is, the fire was set by someone else. The homeless people had been uh, targeted by, they hadn't been targeted, they'd been hit by somebody setting off a firework by mistake. And the, and the refugees had indeed been gathering, but what they'd been doing, and they'd been praising God because of the ceasefire in Aleppo, not because they were more mongering. But this is incredibly difficult um, to disprove. And so when the German journalist who actually, and this is going to ring true for those of you who are journalists in, the, in, this, in this room, um, the journalist who, tried to, who wrote the original story on which Breitbart based their report, then try to correct this, and he got something very friendly in return. There's his, tw there's his tweet saying, actually, they were just celebrating the ceasefire, and he got a friendly little death threat right afterwards, and more death threats coming, and more threats, and more threats, and more attacks via social media. I actually spoke to him. Um, so the thing is, the problem with this story is that it was incredibly difficult to disprove, and Breitbart itself refuses to this day to say that it is an incorrect story because it's a very s clever splicing of fact and fake. And if it's that difficult for us adults to decipher, then how on earth are children going to be able um, to do this? So, and months later, as you can tell, this child, this 13-year-old, is still telling me that in actual fact, Syrians really behave quite badly and... 
it's their own fault if we don't like them. <laughs> and if, you know, and Merkel was probably wrong to let them all in in the first place, right? If you've been following the whole German thing, that's, a, you know, it's been a, that's been a huge debate. Anyway, so, and this is a big problem. Like the, Europe, the, the UK communications watchdog Ofcom says that children are online and consuming information for about 15 hours a week, and that's a very conservative estimate. Um, and the EU barometer from a while ago said that 50%, 52% of uh, respondents to a big survey said they de distrust the media, and as we know, that's enough to win you an election, you know, going either way. Um, so here's me doing a session. I'm going to now tell you a little bit of what we do, right? So when I've told you the problem. Um, so what we do is um, we send working journalists into schools and they give 90 minute sessions to kids and they talk about two things. On the first hand, they speak about fake news, disinformation, we get them to vote, we get the kids to decide whether a, whether a story is real or not. Um, and um, We've got an awful lot of feedback. There's some here, but I've, I'll, I'll tell you the things that I think is, are the most important ones that we've now seen on the basis of about 420 kids um, responding and giving us feedback and everything. And that is that no classroom is immune to this. Even the ones that have had media literacy education before still fall for the lies. Um, um, 14 and 15 year olds are actively sharing stuff. They're getting into fights on an almost daily basis about things. They're using their emoticons more and more. Things are really, this kind of speeds up an awful lot between them. Um, it's not just a problem for poor or underprivileged kids. This is also a, an issue for children from very privileged um, ranks of society, um, where we've also tested those kind of classrooms. Um, the good thing about it is that kids actually have an innate ability to recognize this stuff. So what we do is we, we try not to come with very, and I really want to know, like if there's any practitioners out here, I'd love to hear about how you do it, but we decided let's not come with our own words. Let's not come into the classroom and go, this is manipulation and propaganda and it's called fake news or disinformation or all of these things. And instead we invite the kids to come with their own words. What do you call this? What is it? And they come with really interesting words. So you find that, that when you ask, what is it? They'll come with very surprising words like, oh, it's revenge or it's um, money making. And in fact, a lot of the kids understand very well that this is an issue about making money because they're all on YouTube, right? So they get it. They all want to be YouTubers this, these days. They don't want to be footballers or models anymore or s superstars. They want to be on YouTube. Um, and on the other hand, they also really understand this idea of manipulating people's perceptions via their screen, because this is what they do every day on their digital playground. They decide what kind of photo are they going to send of themselves, of their friend, of their frenemy, every single day. So they have this innate understanding that's probably much more sophisticated than ours, which they use every day to navigate their little world. Their little world, I'm sorry, I don't mean that um, in any disparaging way. Um, they just haven't directed that view into the adult world of, of news. And once they do, they understand it really well, which is incredibly um, rewarding and really like a very positive thing. So um, the bad news about the teachers is that um, they're mainly enormously unprepared for this. They often come up to us afterwards and say, oh my God, why are my 11-year-old children all on Facebook? Or they're not allowed to. What? I had no, what does clickbait mean, you know? Um, um, and why do they know all of this? I thought the IT teacher had already taught them all of this. Um, and the good thing is, is that the teachers, once we've been in, um, actually all want more information. And what we then do is we lead them on to uh, media literacy projects um, that are out there. Um, and the other thing that we talk about, or, which I think is at least as important and takes up half of our sessions, um, is that, and this is why we employ journalists and not just teachers or consultants or trainers or whatever. We send journalists into the classroom so that the journalists can talk to them and fess up to media bias in the professional media. Um, because this is a real problem that a lot of journalists don't often get the chance to admit or perhaps don't necessarily want to admit. But it is true that in big and small ways, even the professional press even by the way it chooses its stories, it's, you know, it's, you've, you've all had to do news judgment, right? We're now we're getting better and better at targeting our audiences. We know what's a clickable headline. 
our publishers certainly know, and we also are more and more squeezed in our business models and therefore have to, just from an economic point of view, somehow make sure we keep our audiences and give them what they want to already hear. So if you look at it, and I don't know, and I'd love to hear from you whether any kind of real um, study has been done about the move, but certainly in the UK, I would say that a lot of the press has been moving into much more, much more polarized positions. And that's something that we feel that the kids really need to understand. Um, uh, I'm gonna show you something that looks quite scary. Somebody's actually mapped media bias. There's a patent lawyer in the US called um, Vanessa Otero who's actually mapped it. This is incredibly complicated, so don't worry. You're not going to be able to read it. So this describes the US media, and the US media is supposedly very, very strict and neutral along a left to right axis, political axis, right? Liberal to conservative. And if you can't read it, believe me, it's just as difficult to read when you're actually sitting right in front of it. But we try, so we go from this thing like, okay, here's the reality, and we want children to know this because we believe that only when children understand that even the professional, you know, bona fide press makes mistakes, has a particular bias perhaps, has a particular focus, um, and they understand that that happens, can they then understand it enough to tell it apart from the outright lies and become immune a little to the sort of attacks of the, what, you know, what, Trump likes to call the fake news um, media. Um, so we created these interactive games for the children to really internalize physically how easy it is, for, and we do this for the two um, age groups that we target, how easy it is for, um, to tell a story that's one-sided um, or incomplete. Um, and, um, and we really do think that actually being able to tell the difference between the lies and the bias reporting, that's one of the most important things. The effect of all of this is really electrifying. It's 90 minutes, and the kids love it. I'm going to show you, so, I'm going to show you some testimonials. Um, the kids love it. They get it that this is a, like a real adult issue, and somebody has bothered to come into the classroom and talk to them about it, a real live journalist. Also closing this gap between citizens and journalists, which can do so much damage. The teachers, the teachers really like it. Um, this one, the lower one is one of my favorite quotes. This is a very, quite a radically left-leaning um, teacher, very progressive, really great guy, but clearly on the left side of the spectrum. And just to show that we're actually trying to be unpolitical, we're not, you know, we're actually just trying to bring people back into the messy center where reality actually happens. And he said, you can read it, um, I'm now reading a much more balanced kind of variety of news. Um, and I really love that he said that. And this is also, somebody asked me yesterday about like, what the impact, how do you measure the impact of what you do? And this is one of the ones where we were approached after a session by the head teacher of a school who said, oh God, this is amazing. It makes so much sense. We're gonna add a, whole, a, mission, a, a point to our mission statement online, which I think is really lovely. And obviously the journalists totally love it because as you all know, Journalists love to talk about themselves. They love to have an audience. <laughs> and, um, and they really, it's a really wonderful feeling, you know, and the kids afterwards sometimes come up and go, oh, can I have your autograph or something? You're like, believe me, you don't want my autograph. Um, uh, so I think that's it, really. Um, right now what we're doing is, um, so the journalists are really our lifeblood, right? right? So right now what we're doing, we're scaling it, we're, we're training more teachers, we're sending them out to more schools. The idea is we're now based in Belgium and in Germany, and the idea is to really scale that within those two countries, but to go into a third country before the end of the year. We're fully funded for three years, and the idea is to really have a, 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 the kind of script that's very easily translatable. You can just translate it from one language to another and just go, put it into classrooms in Italy, in the Netherlands, in Austria, wherever it might be. We've tested it on these two countries, um, and it's worked. So, um, and what we're also working on on a more sort of um, advocacy level is to really try and get media literacy and news literacy to become part of teacher training um, colleges because it really it's the teachers that carry this and that have to buy into it for actually for it to have an effect. Um, um, and of course, with the 90 minutes that we have when we go in, 
um, we can't reach a lot. We can't actually do everything. We can't answer all of their questions, right? But what we can do is we can plant little question marks into all of their heads, the heads of the children and the heads of the teachers. And once those question marks are in there, then all sorts of amazing and brilliant things um, can happen. And that's all for me about lie detectors for now. Questions first off, uh, how you choose to choose, how you choose the journalists? Okay. Can anybody do it? Oh, good question. So um, I'm bracing for the day when a Breitbart journalist wants to take our course, <laughs> but we actually have it in our in our statement in our business plan that we the, that we reserve the right to choose the journalists. So we choose journalists who are who you know either from a very reputable news organisation or from a very or you know we know them from. Um, journalism school circles that are very, you know, with a very high level. We try, you know, we, we really try and take journalists who, um, who are good. Right, we have, at the moment, we've got uh, ARD and, um, and a former Spiegel person going into Leipzig because we're also trying to, did you say what countries do we choose? No. Is that your question? What your well, the question, question was, how do you choose the journalists? How do you choose Can journalists? anybody do it? Can anyone? Well, I mean, you know, it's incredibly easy. You do it for, for it's a four-hour workshop, and then afterwards, um, you have to basically sign up to our code of ethics, which says, I'll be, yes, I'll go into classrooms and I promise I'll not be political. I won't go on some sort of crazed political rave um, and I will, I will actually use the script because the script, by the way, is incredibly important and we've developed it with the feedback of hundreds of children and lots of teachers and educational psychologists because when you're, when you're talking about this kind of stuff, you can also really get it wrong. There's like a lot of things like kids' attention spans, and I didn't know this at all when I started, right? There's been a massive learning curve for me. But how do you speak to kids about this? How do you keep their attention? And how do you make sure when you're talking to them about fake stuff that they don't actually come away thinking, oh, that was real, like the guy really did marry the snake or something, you know, um, because they actually weren't paying attention. They were like scribbling little doodles. So we work a lot with them, um, like seating the kids and doing like, physical stuff so that they remember it in the correct way. I mean, just to give one example about bias, uh, one very simple thing is half of the class stays inside and has to say, what do I see inside the room? The other part of the class goes outside and say, what does the school look like? And then they realize uh, this is a point of view. I, d I didn't get the whole picture being in a room. I didn't get the whole picture looking at the outside. So very simple things. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the, the snake example, Yanni just mentioned in passing, I really love that snake example. There's a fake news, Indian guy marries a snake. Is it true or not? Of course, all grown-ups would say it's not true. But then you should yeah. see the children discuss it. Could it be true? If the snake is nice, why shouldn't he marry her then? And, and then another says, no, you can't marry snakes. And then you have the kids discussing on their own terms. That, that, so what you mentioned in the beginning, we don't bring this huge terminology. There's a lot of you know, academic research and a lot of complicated words for children. Uh, and we, we, we don't come with this you know, whole apparatus and put it on them, but we let them discuss in their own words how they see it. And then it is sometimes it's very amazing because as a grown up and as a journalist, you feel, yeah, well, you've seen it all as we know. And then the kids have a completely fresh point of view yeah. on, on, on the most amazing things. And then they discuss it in class and it's, it's and also what, what you said, like you can't underestimate it. It is not an issue of poor people or rich people. We have, we have very similar issues, irrespective of where the school is, in rich areas or in poor areas. Uh, I would say 80, 90% of the questions are the same. It's, n it's not a, a social stratification issue so much. Yeah. What I also find really interesting is where, so you have to really learn to live with the silence in the classroom. Um, and this is also what we teach the journalists about, like let the question sink. And when we're doing the vote, like we show them a bunch of stories. Um, they have to be age relevant, obviously. And we get them to vote and you see, and this is just like little ecosystems and silos online. See one kid raising his hand because he thinks that the story is true. And then the one sitting around him will gradually, you know, people sit together with their friends anyway, because we get people to come to the front. So they're kind of sitting together in their clusters. And, um, and they vote in clusters, which is really interesting. Um, you know, because they, you believe what your friend believes. So we actually, we've been collecting all of this feedback as well, and we're working with, um, with academia. We're now hoping to start a collaboration with a university in Belgium and in Germany as well, so that we can get, like, um, actual academics to follow this and actually 
measure the long-term impact and actually do something with this incredible feedback we get on the media consumption of these children, how they interact with it. Uh, another question I would have is, looking at the conferences, there's a lot of stuff going on about the topic. Fake news, debunking, verification. Uh, it's, it's become a profession or an industry. Three, four, five years ago, it was just yeah. a very few people would do it. And now there's a lot of experts or self-styled experts or whatever. A lot of journalists have been addressing this. Uh, what is the, how, how you differentiate yourself in this rather crowded field? If right. you so first of all, um, it's true. It's all of a sudden become incredibly sexy, you know, and uh, you have all these like media literacy professionals have been working in the dark for years in their little rooms at the Sorbonne or when, you know, and all of a sudden all the bright lights are shining on them. Um, well, I'd say the more of these initiatives there are, the better there can't be enough of them because the problem is so immediate it's so much now and we can't wait we can't wait just for the public authorities to act we can't wait you know like we're in this high level um working group and so we're advising on sort of long-term goals but i'm telling you that day by day and post by post these things are damaging the children's minds you know we need to do something immediately so the more people are doing it the better as far as i can see um the other thing i would say is that um we, <clears throat> we try not to replicate too much of what's already going on. Our thing really is to create the face-to-face -face contact between the children and the, and the journalists. And um, so a lot of the journalists come already with their own uh, media literacy projects. So we just, we just train them on how to talk to the kids for 90 minutes. And afterwards, once we've got the attention of the teachers and the children, we then lead them on to the existing media literacy stuff that is already out there. So basically we're trying to amplify and amplify and accelerate and accelerate as much as we possibly can. Um, and the other thing I'd say about that is that we, um, we're we lucky to be in this high level group and I started this in Belgium just because I live in Belgium, but you actually find that just by virtue of being in Brussels, you immediately it immediately accelerates quite quickly because you start talking to people from Whatever the whatever the culture ministry from Sweden who are interested, you know, it's like a, a really great sort of um, area for synergies. And we have this double edit, um, double uh, you know t approach from the top down with our advocacy, where we're advocating for school uh, for training teacher training curricula to to include media literacy and this very practical grassroots work. So uh, it's a two pronged approach. That means uh, the. the the guys in the middle get pressure from up and down. Is that the idea? <laughs> yes. There's no pressure. It's all very beautiful. <laughs> no, I don't know. Well, who, would, who would be in the middle? I don't know. Who would be in the middle? Teachers. The teachers? Well, that's the thing. We try and make it as easy as possible. That's the other thing, right? There's all sorts of... Um, oh, yeah, because the other thing is, like, the uptake from the teachers is so critical. Um, you know, very often I'll come into a classroom when I'm doing a test session, and I'll find a teacher who says... Oh, thank God you're here. Just ignore me. I'm going to sit in the back. I've got a stack of papers I've got to mark. Just ignore me. And at the end of the session, they'll come and they'll be engaged, right? But really, the, the fundamental, and this is no disrespect to teachers at all, we all know they're underpaid, massively overworked. So the last thing we need is huge mandates from above, you know, saying, you now must also do this, you know, because they just don't have time. So we try and make it as easy as possible for them with no preparation. I'll leave it at that, I'll open it to the floor. Any question from your side? And then I have two more, three more questions here. The man at the back. Um, yes, Julian. Thank you for this presentation. Um, I, I'm really intrigued to understand what the children think. So can you tell us, can you tell us what the two biggest questions they ask you are? Huh, okay. Um, thank you. So, uh, they sometimes, and I love it when they do this, ask, have you, you the journalist, have you ever written fake news? And that's a really great conversation because when you start unpacking that, it's really great. It's really good for a, 
for a journalist because if they see that we are journalists, we're human beings, every, you know, everybody's now a news consumer, right? And we're all citizen journalists and God knows what, right? But very few people actually know how journalism is actually put together, you know, all the bits that take to make a proper story, right? And if you can then address that and actually admit to some of your failings, it humanizes it and it just makes actually just the, the credibility of the professional press that much more robust. And the other question, hang on a second, what was the other question? Oh, they often do actually come and say, oh my God, with all this fake stuff out there, what, what can we read that's absolutely right? <laughs> and then we have to say, well, actually, if it's a, you know, an important enough story, then you probably should read all sorts of different places. Don't just rely on one. You know, because they might have, you know, just like you've just seen in this game that we've just played, you just ran out of time. Well, maybe this journalist ran out of time. So just if it's an important enough thing to you, then um, then read around and read as much as possible. Don't rely on any one single source. Thank you. I know we talked uh, today a lot about fake news and uh, Donald Trump made it sexy uh, by uh, uh, vulgarizing this term, fake news. While fake news is just lie and it has existed uh, since human uh, are human. And um, I know that uh, social media make it easier today just spread any kind of information that uh, lie, manipulation, etc. And what you are trying with the kids is to um, tell them uh, adults uh, don't necessarily tell the truth all the time. And um, me, I'm just thinking a wider, wider picture, like uh, how we teach uh, kids to not believe what adults uh, uh, tell them. And does that, does that not start at home uh, with education? with um, teaching children uh, to keep uh, their critical thinking and uh, to not always believe what they've been told and does that not that start at home? And uh, do you involve the, the parents uh, with what you do and you have experience with uh, talking also with the parents? That's a really, really great question. And we find that at age 10 and 11, by the way, the, the reason why we do, we do kids age 10 and 11, normally in their first year of secondary school, and aged 14, 15, because we try and bookend those parts where they first start actually reading stuff online, they stop just playing games online, and when they start making up their own minds, 14, 15, about the world, maybe questioning what their teachers or parents are saying. And um, what we found in, in Brussels, we did a lot of the tests in Brussels, it's absolutely fascinating, um, at the European schools, and the European schools have got incredibly sort of high level, you know, kids from high ranking bureaucrats officials and diplomats and God knows what, you know, and they've got like high level dinner table conversations you can imagine, right? And even in those classes, you find that um, by the time the kids are 14 and 15, you're absolutely right, the class divides on an East and West Europe axis on questions such as religious tolerance or asylum rights and things like that. We've not, so no, we have not um, started working with parents yet. Right now, what we're trying to do is work with the kids and with the teachers. But I can I can imagine it happening. Um, what was your other question? It was really like, what, how do you undo what's being done? Well, and I think that that's actually why we have to start at age 10 and 11, that they keep asking. And we try and make it fun for them, that it's actually fun to ask questions. You know what I mean? You can find out some really cool stuff if you just actually you know, question the belief that you might have already, you know, held. And what we also find, which is very interesting, is that nobody fundamentally wants to be duped, you know? Nobody wants to believe that the guy married the snake when he didn't actually marry the snake. But it's exactly as you say, once you believe something, it's really hard to stop believing it. You don't want to stop believing it because it's admitting to a fault. And, and that's where we really, we talk a lot about the questions. Just keep questioning, keep questioning, keep looking at things from different angles and you'll actually have fun and learn a lot. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Barbara Galani, I work for the European Food Safety Authority. We try and communicate about uh, science and safe food. Uh, and uh, as you we were talking, it's a fantastic program. It's fascinating. And I identified a lot of the similar challenges uh, with media literacy that we've had uh, for quite some time with science literacy. 
uh, and it's about uh, the reputable sources, it's about uh, identify good and bad science, uh, the bias, uh, the evidence, uh, and questioning it, uh, and keeping an open mind. So we didn't get it quite right with <laughs> science literacy and understanding of science. What can we learn from your experience and how can we combine the media and science literacy to have a, a bit more of resonance? Okay, so your question is really also about science, science literacy, right? So that's a really good question. I was just talking to somebody from the, um, the European Health Parliament. Have you ever heard of them? So they're, you know, I was talking to somebody in Brussels. So it sounds like they do really great stuff. And they are actually currently um, developing teaching modules um, to do with science literacy. And what we're hoping, I mean, and this is like, we've finished our test phase last October and we're now scaling it, right? But what our aim is in the end is to be able to lead teachers to um, media literacy modules, right? And they can be in whatever subject they should be. So, you know, if you come up with some really great training scheme, you know, if we go into the classroom of somebody who's got some, a little bit of an interest in science as well, then they can go to that because you're absolutely right, science literacy, uh, numeral <laughs> literacy, you know, they should be able to question. This is why, by the way, we're so adamant that this be integrated in teacher, teacher training colleges because what the idea is that it doesn't, shouldn't matter whether you're an arts teacher or a, or a physics teacher, a maths teacher, biology, ethics, who cares, right? You should be able to talk about media literacy so that children, regardless of what subjects they take, are always going to be taught how to verify their sources. So it's a really, really good question, and I'm really hoping that we'll be able to integrate that and then lead the classrooms, lead the teachers into all of these directions. Maybe also one, one comment on this one. Um, the problem is with the teachers, everybody say, says it's the other guy. I'm the mathematics teacher, not the physics teacher does it, or the IT guy does it, or uh, the German teacher does it, or the English teacher does it. So everybody is basically, since they're not so savvy on this, wants somebody else to do it. And nobody says it's my topic, because media literacy is not a topic like biology or, or geography. So in the systems of schools that are based on, you know, 19th century, if you like, notions of what is, how, how the world is being sub, uh, divided, mm -hmm. uh, it, there is no one uh, curriculum that, that addresses this. And then it's usually down to individual teachers' enthusiasm or interest, or especially if they have kids that age, they, they, they struggle with it at home, so they, they realize there's something going on here and I should address it. But the idea would be that teacher training colleges or that, would, that this would become an integral part of all teacher training of any teachers that go into school and also what we see is the younger generation of teachers who are now at university, they grow up with this, so it's an easier sell to them than to uh, somebody like my age who's been teaching you know, class for 50 years and he doesn't want to be look like a fool and not know enough. Mm. Uh, same goes for journalists. You know, journalists never would admit they don't know anything. They always say, yeah, sure, I, I know it or I can find it out by tomorrow. So the, the teachers, it, it's, an edu it, it's more than just single courses. It, 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 it will need the change of a, a whole ecosystem of what is important, what are skills, and what, what do kids need to learn. And it is not divided by this traditional uh, biology, geography, physics, uh, uh, separation that the kids have now. So this is difficult. Uh, I'll come to the other, the other question here. The challenge is there. It sounds in walk in the park. This is a great idea. Everybody needs it. Any challenges? Any, did, you ever, <laughs> did you ever experience like get lost or we don't want you or we don't, this is not good or um, something like that? Amazingly, not yet. Ama amazingly, ama amazingly. And you have to think like we only, uh, we started it in, we started our first test sessions in February of 2017. We only became incorporated as a, as a non-profit in July of 2017, so we've not even existed for a year. But the speed at which this is going, it's really quite extraordinary, you know. Um, I mean, I'm invited to come here and talk to you about this. Um, and, you know, we're going to all sorts of places. Um, the challenge, oh my God, the challenges are um, scaling it you know, and herding journalists, you know, like, like we're journalists because we don't like people telling us what to do. <laughs> so I'm actually right now figuring out with a programmer how to make a, a, a scheduling app, you know, and I know that Uber taxis are in many places are very, 
evil word, right? But I would love for a teacher to be able to say, you know, here I am, I'm in Perugia, and my kids are uh, 11 and 12, and I have time on Wednesday afternoons, and then, you know, bloop, and then there's like five journalists in the vicinity who've been trained, and one of them says, I can go, you know? So that's actually, that's actually a challenge. Um, right now we're doing it with an awful lot of charts on walls, and I'm always thinking, oh God, I hope it doesn't go wrong. <laughs> um, and the uptake, the uptake from the teachers. So, so far we've had a really, really great experience and we're riding this wave right now. Everybody knows about it. And I get emails from like, I don't know, a teacher, I got a, an email from a teacher in the Canary Islands going, I know that you probably won't come to the Canary Islands, but can you just tell me what material I can um, do so you know right now the uptake is great I can foresee that when this is you know just like with any fad right when the fake news fad is over and people are sick to death of hearing about it maybe the teachers won't be quite as interested and I just really hope then that the very the idea of a journalist coming in and giving a session and a fresh face coming in and relieving the the uh, um, the teacher of some work for one and a half hours that that will actually carry us through that fatigue for wanting to talk about their profession, which they like to do, obviously, but uh, there's money involved as well. Yes, so um, we don't like working on a volunteer basis because we do actually expect people to deliver something, right? They have to stick to the script because it's important <coughs> that they not deliver the wrong message. Um, they have to be on time, you know. Journalists being on time, that's also quite difficult, you know, and they also have to deliver um, the feedback sessions because we work a lot with feedback with kids, like literally old-fashioned pen on paper to actually reinforce the learning. Um, and they, so they get paid, they get paid 150 euros per diem for every classroom session. Basically we're like, that's for the effort it takes to spend half a day going to a school, giving the session, coming back, putting the feedback forms into, into the post and, um, and sending it off to us. And once the feedback forms arrive with us, they get their, they get their check. Oh, and what, why else would they like it? I don't know. I mean, do you guys like the idea of it? How many of you are journalists in this room? Right. And how many of you journalists would actually feel like it would be a, a, a nice idea to go into a classroom? Yeah, so most of you, right? Yeah. I mean, what? also, we, we have experience now in Germany and in Belgium, and uh, we don't know what it will be like in Hungary or in Poland or in, in Slovakia, where access to schools might be more regulated. This is a very open situation, and normally when teachers say you can come into my class, you don't need to fill 27 forms b before you can go into class. I'm not sure what the situation would be like in Hungary. They might not admit you to class. Any ideas on that? You have a big stick somewhere. <laughs> so we were actually talking, you know about this, right? We were talking loosely with an organization about taking this to Poland, and there's been um, interest from Ukraine and from Belarus. Um, and uh, I don't know. I think we'd actually probably have to work really hard to adapt the script to make sure that, um, because just like when you were asking what about the kids that get this stuff from home, and, and I can tell you that in these classrooms in Brussels, the, you know, the, the audience breaks down on, le you know, on, on East and Western Europe. Um, I don't know, but it's something that we want to do. We've not done it yet. But I, I imagine that this whole, I kind of imagine that this open approach that we take and the fact that they come up with the answers themselves um, and this innate thing that kids are curious and that people don't want to be duped, that hopefully will, that's hopefully a formula that will, I mean, finding the good journalists, I'm sure there's good journalists out there. It's just a matter of finding them, sending them out. Question here. Um. <coughs> uh, ju just, a, just a brief comment. Uh, con congratulations to that. Um, uh, to, to that entire concept and to what you're doing. Um, I was thinking, I mean, it's really a matter of scaling it right now and um, getting it into different countries and scaling it in Germany and so on. And so I was wondering if you're, if you're speaking to Ashoka because uh, they would be certainly interested in hearing about that and they have a network of thousands of, I mean, they, say they, they support social entrepreneurs and that's actually what, what you're doing there. Um, and I think they would really love that. And uh, you, you apply there as a, as, a, as, a, as a fellow, as an Ashoka fellow, and you get all the support from 
uh, I don't know, uh, all sorts of uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers helps with a business plan, uh, Hill and Knowlton help with a PR, and et cetera, et cetera. So, and they have just a very broad network. And probably that is an idea for you to, to approach them, ashoka.org. Thank you. I'll see you afterwards and take a note of all of that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thanks. Exactly. Like, wherever we can, we try to piggyback onto infrastructures that already exist, you know? So if there are, um, whatever, like, I know in the UK, we're not currently active in the UK, but in the UK, there's a fabulous um, organization called Speakers Trust, who send people into schools to give training on debating skills and things. And we, if we were to go in there, we would hope, you know, and obviously there's, like, not at all uh, uh, agreed with anyone, but the idea is... God, if there's somewhere, someone who already does access all these schools, let's just piggyback on their backs and go, exactly, because the scaling is so important. Lithuania, so I wanted to follow up with your discussion about how would it grow in Ukraine or Hungary. Um, because in Lithuania, we are doing this. We are, my colleague Karol is, we are um, journalists, and we have a, our agency, our own agency, and actually other organizations invite us to go to schools and we started to prepare methodology programs for teachers. So we work with students and with teachers and sometimes it's hard to get in schools. They don't want to let us in because of the schedule of um, they have to find the time or whatever and some of the teachers are also very skeptical and they don't want to do it. But after that, it's everything just like you said. They want us to come back. Uh, they talk to their colleagues and their colleagues invite us. So the organizations that we work with, they want to continue, they look for funding and to just to expand. So I also wanted to talk maybe with you after that so that we maybe could connect everything <laughs> instead of just working separately and um, bring something from your experience to our place as well. And how many um, schools are you in contact with? moment so last year our colleagues from the agency did 10 schools and we went to the uh, they went to smaller towns like to some schools uh, with ethnical uh, minorities and so it was all over the country going out from the big cities to smaller towns and, and wow. um, all over the, <laughs> the country so this year we want to do again um, some other schools in in the in the sub in the like areas that uh, not many journalists can go, would go uh, uh, in opposed to capital city, for example, or other mm -hmm. big towns. Um, so we're going to continue, and we're going to work with uh, s uh, with uh, teachers who come to Vilnius, for example, to capital city for the workshop. They learn how to use social media to understand how it works, and um, they are also very engaged after <laughs> they know yeah. how it works, and then they have ability to work with students and talk about that. So that sounds amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to talk to you afterwards about that. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Alexandra Fleger. I'm from the U.S. and I'm studying abroad. Um, I was wondering, how do you fund um, lie detectors? I know you said you pay them journalists 150 euro per session. Um, are you a nonprofit, or how do you go about that? Okay, so um, we actually get all of our money from the U.S. Um, from something called the. It was on the first slide. The WIS Foundation. The WIS Foundation is a really bizarre place to get the money from. Um, it is a land conservation foundation. They normally um, buy vast tracts of land in the US and I think in Romania and possibly in Argentina or something. You know, they buy land and then donate it to the government and say, here you go, here's a national park. Um, and bizarrely, we have found that um, there's an overlap of interest between uh, conservation and environmental groups and this field because probably because I don't know this for a fact but probably because people working on climate change and in the envir environment have been worrying about climate change deniers for a lot longer than we've been talking about fake news so we get it from that yes we are we're a non-profit it actually took ages to do it took a really long time and when I started this I kind of just like had to like live on my savings for a really long time because um, there's a lot of um, legislation to do with you know anti-terror rules and money laundering directives and everything so if you're getting money from a from a u.s charity from a u.s 501c3 which is what the wisp foundation is you actually have to put it through a vetting process and the ones who vet it for us are a belgian a very well-known um, belgian institution called the king badwin foundation and they basically did all the checks so we have to report not only to our funders, 
but also to the King Badwin Foundation to make sure it's all like going according to plan. And we gave them a three-year plan, um, and they decided yes, and so that's it. We're, we're fine for three years. We're really lucky not to have to be looking around for money for a, for a while. <laughs> Thank you for coming here. Um, I wondered what are your general thoughts on the school system? Do you think it works that um, it brings out critical thinkers? Uh, yeah, how, how uh, or because the, the whole system has to work in order that your program can also, um, yeah, work. work. Yeah. Um, it really varies from teacher to teacher. So we've gone into schools, into different ones, like, you know, teachers refer refer us within a school. You know, there'll be one teacher who'll go, oh, I loved it, and, I'll, and then they'll tell everyone, you know, over coffee, and then we'll get more requests. And you can really see that within one school, one school system, it really varies enormously from, um, from teacher to teacher, and also from classroom to classroom. You know, some classrooms are just, you know, you can't, you're working with human beings, you can't gauge it. And you know, sometimes it does actually happen. You know, I say the process is electrifying and it really is most of the time. And you also sometimes walk into a classroom of 14 and 15 year olds who are so desperately shy that they won't say a word and it's incredibly uncomfortable. And then you know afterwards from the feedback that actually sometimes the, the, um, the quiet classrooms are actually equally as engaged, you know, and they're really getting it. They just don't want to say anything because they're embarrassed or their voices are breaking or God knows what's happening to them. Um, and so that's why we've also adapted the script because we're, we're training the journalists and we, 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 you know, the journalists are our gold, you know, that's our reserve, these amazing professionals who can talk because one third of the script, by the way, is, is, is up to improvisation. Two thirds are scripted and one third of the visit is up to them to talk. And so we really need the journalists to come in and really come in with their fresh blood and their experience of like some local story that they covered and everything. And we need for them to be, to have a nice time. And so therefore, and sometimes journalists can actually be quite scared of going to talk to kids. Like this is a totally new thing. We're so happy doing our fact checking behind our screen and saying that's wrong and that's wrong and we're right and everything. But to actually go into a classroom can be quite terrible. So we've rewritten the script so that the, 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 the journalist can, can, uh, can pivot between a quiet classroom and a lively classroom so that we actually address the difference. But you know, in all in all, uh, the educational system, even in Finland, and I've not been to Finland, but I've been told, and this is only anecdotal, okay? I can't say anything about the whole country or anything. Like Finland is an amazing example of a country where media literacy has become a mandatory part of the school curriculum, and still, the media literacy practitioners worry about uptake from the teachers. It's really about activating, and I think, and I've had teachers tell me that a lot of it is down to the leadership of the head teacher, and that that really will guide a school. And then again, we've got human beings, and it varies from day to day. fundraiser and as a communicator and uh, first thing I would like to highlight an opportunity that can be also interesting for other people in the room. I'm involved in a European initiative that is called Next Generation Internet and we are setting up some awards so there are awards concerning uh, research, awards concerning startups and awards concerning a culture of the next generation internet where I could see initiatives like yours uh, fit. So Next Generation Internet is about making it a bit more respectful <laughs> of the users and uh, spreading more awareness about it can work and uh, having different business models that are not just based on data extraction. So if you want, we can talk later, but there is this opportunity uh, <coughs> going on in Europe. Oh, and, uh, and then I had a question. Um, Brussels is a very specific place and you were mentioning a kind of uh, upper class uh, kind of schools. Mm. So I was wondering if you uh, work also with um, more complicated, let's say, situations and if, if you have mm, kind of find uh, some different patterns and uh, I mean, how do you make what you do relevant in different 
different contexts. Thank okay. you. That's a really good point. Yes. So uh, um, this is the reason why we've gone into s we have such uh, wide exposure to privileged classes is because my working language is English, right? And Belgium, as you know, is bilingual French and Dutch, and so I started it in English. I had started the script together with other people and psychologists and teachers and things, but I went into the uh, the English-speaking schools, which are by default in Brussels, you know, the higher ones, work. I can't wait, and what we're doing right now, so then we've translated it into German, and in Germany, we went, we've been going into German schools. Uh, very recently, we actually started going into Saxony, and we really want to um, work in that area where, you know, I don't know, like Germany, uh, well, polit the political map of Germany is quite interesting, and, and Saxony is a very particular case where there's there's been quite a lot of um, extremism um, and so we really you know we're starting to go there and I can't wait to do more of it and in Brussels I can't wait to translate this into French we're just doing that right now literally right now I've got a translator working on the script so that we can and we're talking to the uh, the, the, the French speaking state broadcaster in Belgium I want to start going into um, Molenbeek which you know, is, is a really problematic area in Brussels and everywhere, so it should work. It's designed to work because it's designed to bring stuff out from the kids. You do sometimes see that in Berlin, we've seen that um, sometimes the kids are more unruly and everything, but actually they're getting to play games and the younger ones are getting to move around, you know, and they, they just like it. They're like solving puzzles and things. So, so far it's worked. You know, in the various, I can't say that we've been in really, really, really problematic areas. We have been to one problematic area, but it was a good school in that problematic area, right? We've not been to a nightmare school yet. I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> I have two more, and then we have to wrap it up. Huh? Perfect. Okay, hello. So, yeah, I'm Karolus Kishnausis from Nanook Multimedia in Lithuania, and uh, uh, I was wondering. Uh, do you meet children that are, who are aware that they are consuming biased media, but they do it by their own choice? For example, maybe there are, uh, for example, people who consume, let's say, Breitbart news, they don't expect them to be uh, objective. They like that they are like this. They think that this is a, some kind of part of counterculture. And uh, maybe children being in their teenage years, they think that oh, I won't read this like, objective news, I'll go here, and I know that my teachers won't like it, and then I will be um, counterculture, or I will be rebel. Because those publications want to sell them like that. That's how they get you, I think. I wonder, do you, um, do you face that? Or maybe when the kids are like 10, 11 years old, they are not really caring about ideology, and maybe that's the, maybe that's the age when you actually can get them on the right path, so they won't be radicalized in the future. Thank you. Um, yes, yes, we do. Um, were you there? Were you, in the, you might have been there. Oh, never mind. There was a very recently there was a, a classroom visit where um, where one of the boys was actually reading Russia Today a lot and uh, what else? I can't, and maybe it was Sputnik or something. And he was circulating it on Facebook uh, and Snapchat. No, I don't remember. I don't remember the platforms he was using. But he was circulating it among his. Um, his fellow students with the express purpose of getting everybody really angry, right? And we do, we do talk, so yes, absolutely that happens. And we talk about that. So we talk, um, uh, we give them like, um, we, I've not actually talked about this because it's really uh, obvious. We give them like a little toolkit, like we give them the, like the, the, the US Association of Librarians has come up with a really nice visual thing that they've allowed us to use. Um, and one of those things, like what check, check the headline, check the date, check the URL, all the things that we know, right? But also check your own bias, like, and then, and we talk quite a lot. And this is one of the things we, you know, we ask the journalists to really remember to talk about that the stories are out there because we want them to be out there, you know? Because we want the children to understand that it is the demand that feeds it, you know? If there's clickbait, it's there because people are clicking on it you know, and that the kids can understand it. You need to demystify it. It's not going away. And if the kids can actually learn, I actually think, I don't know what you all think, right? But if this stuff is not going away because it's a money-making machine, right? And it's also very p powerful in terms of, you know, moving people's perceptions and people are going to want, carry on wanting to do that, right? But if you can kind of demystify it and take out the thorn so that kids, yeah, sure, let them read Breitbart for a laugh, right? You know, you will read like, 
I don't know, some other newspaper that you know is full of rubbish, but you know, it might be entertaining. If they see it as entertainment, great. What's wrong with that, right? As long as they can tell the difference between a fact and an opinion and a joke and a hoax, you know? That's how we, that's what we think. One last question, and then let's wrap it up. Um, this is just a small detail, but coming back to this um, typical social background school, so I'm in a position, I'm a journalist, and my partner is a teacher at Satcher, Satcher School, and um, I'm absolutely sure that this program would work in this class, because as you said, these, those children as well, they love you know, playing games and discussing, mm -hmm. but uh, to be honest, I would be very afraid to go and face such a class on my own, if I had to go there as a journalist. So. Um, maybe just as a thought, um, have you thought about sending journalists um, as, um, to go there in such schools with difficult social backgrounds um, together, or two journalists? Is, is this a thought? Because, yeah, I would just no, be afraid. That's, <laughs> a, that's a good question. So, first of all, we only ever go into the classrooms with a teacher present, and part of the, um, the training is something incredibly uh, boring but it makes a gigantic difference we always make sure that the journalist talks to the teacher by phone before a session right so that there's like a verbal like a community like conversation that happens and that the the, the the journalist can ask how many kids are there what kind of group is it do they talk a lot da, da, da. and you get interesting answers right you get oh well there's somebody who's quite disruptive but don't worry I'll you know, like then you get the buy-in from the teacher. He'll say, "Don't worry, I'll help you. It's a difficult class, but I'm going to help you." And then, that's it. We never go in alone. But it's a good question. You know, maybe at one point we'll have to go in. And I mean, I, I hope not. Kids aren't. They're not all bad. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I think we have to wrap it up here. Just here. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you very much for the Thank interest. You This is not going away, so there'll be more of that. And uh Das ist am Schlag. Ja, das ist ein 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 Schlag. Ja, das 